So uh, everyone, it is my privilege and genuine honor to introduce you to Laurie Beeman, PhD in FRSC, who is the Canada Research Chair in Religious Diversity and Social Change. A professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa, and she is the director of Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project. And she previously directed the Religion and Diversity Project. Her publications included the just published the Transition of Religion to Culture in Law and Public Discourse, as well as Deep Equality in an Era of Religious Diversity, and Living Well Together in a Non-Religious Future, Contributions from the Sociology of Religion. In 2017, Professor Beeman received the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada Impact Award in the Insight category, and she holds an honorary doctorate from Uppsala University, which is one of my favorite words of all time. <laughs> She also received the Award for Excellence in Research, uh, the Association of Professors of the University of Ottawa in 2017-2018. Professor Beeman's current and engaged areas of research include non-religion, equality, rights and freedoms, human-non-human relationships, law, and religious diversity. Professor Beeman, welcome to our annual general meeting. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I do wish we could all be in the same room together, um, but such is life. And uh, I'm just delighted to, to see, I was sitting in on the meeting for about 20 minutes um, and uh, you have many fascinating things going on. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Today, I've just been asked to talk a little bit about the project, um, Non-Religion in a Complex Future. And so I'll do that. I'm trying to stay to no more than, is it 30 minutes, Rick? Will that be all right? Um, I'd really like to leave time for questions because I think um, the, the group will have some in, not only interesting questions, but interesting suggestions. And at the outset, I would like to say, if after today you have thoughts on what we're doing, you have suggestions, um, please don't hesitate to, to drop me an email. I'd, I'd be delighted to hear from you. So. The project, Non-Religion in a Complex Future, um, funded by the Social, Social Sciences and Humanities Council, uh, uh, Research Council of Canada. Um, it's a seven-year project. It started last April, and um, obviously this year has been a little bit challenging. Um, things were going off, off to a great start, and then, well, we know what happened. So, um, yes, that little swimming image is uh, swimming for our lives is a little bit uh, um, accurate. So. Yes, next slide, please. So background, much of this um, is information that you already have, you already know. Um, there's been a rapid increase in people who identify as having no religion, humanist, atheist, spiritual but not religious, uh, people who are quite simply indifferent. Um, there are all kinds of ways to describe this group, and I'm sure some of you are sitting thinking, oh, non-religion, um, that's a negative term. Yes, absolutely it is. But for the moment, that's what we're using um, to describe this very um, fluid, amorphous, um, um, very diverse group uh, in order to enter in, into some of the topics that I'll talk about today. Uh, I have some figures up here. 25% of people in Canada and the United States identify as non-religious, 18.9% in Argentina, and that was um, a relatively new development. We had those figures uh, last fall. We had a team meeting, and our person, our co-investigator from Argentina, uh, on the plane, he read that new figures had come out from Argentina, and the, I think the bump up was quite significant by about four percentage points. So in Argentina, nearly 20%, uh, 8.1 in Brazil, the slide is gone. So um, about one fifth of Nordic people, and as you I'm sure know, this is complicated by the fact that there's, there are state churches in some of the Nordic countries. And so that's a very complicated relationship for some people who still belong to the church, but don't have any religious identity over 30% of Australians um, identify as non-religious. Uh, from a variety of studies, we know that Britain's uh, non-religious population has almost surpassed the number of people who identify as religious. Um, another quick fact, um, higher numbers among younger people. I have to be honest, though, um, they're higher. But uh, for me, I think this is, um, the, this is interesting only because it signals that uh, it's 
this is a phenomenon that's likely to continue. Um, many, many young people have absolutely no religious reference point, and so they have, it, statistically, people who have some kind of background in religious participation are the people who are more likely to participate, and if young people have absolutely no background, they're uh, unlikely to begin to participate. So um, it's simply an interesting fact for that reason. I am finding uh, baby boomers to be particularly interesting, actually, although they're not the group that most people want to study, um, to say, well, okay, what about people who were raised in some kind of religious tradition but have now left? But that group interests me um, perhaps the most, but that's just my interest. Next slide, please. Um, so, background um, of the project, we, the, the, we are interested in the impact of increased um, non-religion, and we think that it's relatively widespread. We're interested in it at an institutional level, so in law, for example, education and health, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. Um, social processes. For example, charitable giving and volunteering. There's been quite a bit of attention paid to um, the fact that as people become less religious, the charitable giving and volunteering declines. Um, then the data on that are, are a little bit tenuous. And when you actually examine the numbers, uh, which a new uh, book by Sarah Wilkins Laflamme and Joel Thiessen does, the, the differences are not that great. And there are all kinds of things that we need to tease apart in that. So I'll just ask you to sort of bracket that. But social processes, and then third, meaning making, including rituals. So what happens if you don't hold religious funerals? What does, what does celebrating a person's life look like when that person dies? Um, so we're looking at new ways of making meaning. And I've noticed that a number of you uh, have identified as celebrants. I myself am what used to be called a deputy clerk of the Court of Queen's Bench of New Brunswick and is now called an officiant um, and have also over the years uh, done many, many uh, weddings outside of churches. So um, it would be interesting to have that conversation with some of you who have also filled that role. So this, this development is part of what I've described as a new diversity. And the new diversity is uh, made up of people who are non-religious, this new configuration of majoritarian religion, which, as we know in Canada, has traditionally been Christian. Um, so a much smaller church, uh, perhaps a much less powerful church or churches. Um, the second, third piece of that, pardon me, uh, indigenous spiritualities have regained attention um, in large measure due to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and we see the courts grappling with what does it mean to talk about um, indigenous spiritualities, indigenous worldviews, and so on. And then um, the final piece of this is migra migrant religions. So religions that have been present in Canada, but are increasingly present in larger numbers through migration. So this is the new diversity. Um, and so I've argued that we need an evidence-based constructive policies um, to deal with this new diversity. Um, and the, the part of this that I'm most concerned about at this moment in my research program is to gain a better understanding of the non-religious. So next slide, please. So the project's key research objectives, um, developing new research tools to measure and describe non-religion um, beyond the little tick box of Statistics Canada has. How do we think about this? How do we measure it, whatever it is? Um, and we are constantly revisiting that question um, to perhaps reassure you. Analyzing the social impact of non-religion, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the areas of the project. Expand the conceptualization and theorizing of diversity to include non-religion. Um, as you might have noticed, my last project was on religious diversity. And so as a result of doing that project, I saw a huge gap a uh, gap in knowledge and attention being paid to this large group called the non-religious, and so moved my attention there along with a group of other scholars we'll talk about in a second. Um, we're also going to map conflict and collaborations between religious and non-religious social actors. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and advance new knowledge for what I've said is living well together um, to inform public policy and practice. Next slide, please. So we have seven research sites. 
um, Canada is uh, we're we are the main site, if you will, because we're leading this project. I'm the principal investigator. I have two Canadian co-investigators, Salash Lefebvre at the University of Montreal and Peter Beyer, who's my colleague at the University of Ottawa. The other research sites include Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Argentina, and then <laughs> we've, <laughs> for any of you who, who have um, a Swedish, Nor Norwegian, uh, Danish, or Finnish roots, you'll notice and hope for, hopefully forgive me that I've lumped the Nordic countries all into one, um, the Nordic countries. And that was primarily because we had a co-investigator who was very good. She's based in Norway, and she had already done a study of the Nordic countries. And so we just sort of put it in the, the grant proposal as the Nordic countries. But we're quite aware that there are significant differences between these countries, and we'll pay some attention to that as we move through the project. Next slide, please. So this is our project team. Um, I haven't put names down, um, but just to give you a sense of the structure, we have a group of eight co-investigators uh, from each of the countries I've already talked about. We have a group of advisors, one from uh, Australia, one from the United States, and one from um, Britain, all senior scholars who have, um, uh, have worked on the sociology of religion and sociology more broadly for a long time, but also some who have worked on what we've called non-religion. We have a group of Canadian collaborators, eight Canadian collaborators, and one Swedish collaborator who's an expert in media analysis. Uh, we have a student caucus, so we're training students. We have a couple of postdocs presently. Um, and then we have a number of partner organizations. Um, and we are still, we're open always to collaborating with partner organizations. So um, hopefully Humanist Canada will stay involved in these conversations and we'll be able to come to you seeking advice, opinions as we move through the study. It would be of immense value to us. Next slide, please. Oh, did we skip one? Oh, yeah, I think we did. Can you go back? No, okay, sorry about that. So we have five focal areas and axes of analysis. And you can see easily these are you know, migration, health, law, environment, and education. I'll just touch on those quickly to give you a sense of what it is we're talking about. So on the migration, uh, in the migration area, we're asking questions like how are, how are immigrants imagined? Is it possible to be a non-religious Syrian refugee, for example? So I'll give you a quick example in that category. When, if you'll remember, when we were receiving a number of Syrian refugees in Canada, much of the public discourse focused around whether or not small communities could receive Syrian refugees, for example, because small communities did not have mosques or small communities were unable to provide halal food. There was very little conversation about non-religious Syrian refugees. So we're asking questions like, like that around those kinds of issues. Who, um, who, who is religious, who is non-religious, and how? In which groups um, are involved in, for example, refugee settlement? As we know, churches are primarily involved in Canada um, and are settled often um, have the uh, contracts, sorry, I'm forgetting the phrase that we use for this, um, contracts with the federal government to receive refugees. And so what is the impact of this? Um, how are refugees imagined? How are immigrants imagined? Um, and in religious or non-religious terms. Um, that's a sort of quick, very quick um, uh, description of what's happening there. In the area of health, um, we're looking at things like palliative care. How How is palliative care offered to people who self-describe as non-religious when the palliative care systems that we had until very, very recently were framed around uh, religious belonging and religious identity. So how does one offer palliative care? And palliative caregivers have told me that they're still making this transition. They still need guidelines and um, help. And I know, Martin, you have expertise in this area too. Um, so this is something that interests us. What are grieving practices? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about death and dying in a minute. Um, medically assisted dying. Um, these are all issues that we're thinking about, but also things like medic, um, religious exemptions. How does that impact on people who are non-religious? So those are some of the issues and things we're thinking about in that. Law, again, um, many of these things come, um, uh, arise in law, our contests, in law, and I'll talk to you specifically about a couple of projects we're developing. Um, the law project is a little bit further along the design stage, 
phase, so I'm uh, happy to talk a little bit more about that. But how does law shape and how is law dealing with non-religion? Most of the time, non-religion in law appears as atheism, and usually in uh, contests like the Saguenay case, um, where Alain Simoneau challenged prayer before council meetings, um, and we know uh, the public reaction to that Supreme Court decision was quite interesting uh, and maybe surprising. Uh, the number of councils across Canada that were still saying prayers at the beginning of their meetings. So these are the sorts of things that we're looking at. The book uh, that Rick mentioned that I've just finished on religion to culture, I'm very interested in how formerly, if we can say this, formerly religious symbols have now taken on a new life as culture. Um, and that somehow they've become um, almost unassailable if they can wear that culture banner. And so I've thought a bit about this in this book that I've just um, published. Um, it's a kind of bad time to be releasing a book, I must say, because nobody's seeing each other to talk about these things, but um, I guess we're managing. Um, the environment. I'm interested in what might be an emerging worldview uh, with a decline in Christianity, um, whether there's a new worldview emerging that's more egalitarian when it comes to relating to our environment. Um, so I'll talk again a about a couple of projects uh, very, very briefly in a couple of minutes. And then finally, education. So what about access to education for the non-religious? And here I'm thinking particularly about um, Ontario with its split school system, uh, the Catholic school system, um, how do non-religious people access that system, uh, which some people perceive to be a better system with more resources. Um, again, t also asking questions about teaching about religion, um, how is non-religion represented, for example, in the ethics and values course in Quebec, which as we know is now uh, being redesigned, um, so we'll see. Um, so those, those are some of the areas. And then we'll look, a, look at all of these issues around particular axes, like spaces. So what is public space? Who gets to be present? What are the symbols that are present? Who, who decides? Histories. What are the histories, for example? What is the impact of the traditional involvement of religious groups in school systems, in hospital systems, and so on? Uh, regulations. So how are these um, how are how are these presences regulated, negotiated, navigated? Uh, relationships, and I've mentioned already cooperation in world um, cooperation between religious and non-religious groups or people uh, to affect what we've called world repairing activities. So again, dealing with the environment, uh, and then finally representations, and that is the the axis on which we'll do some media analysis and looking at. Uh, perhaps visual images and hopefully even into the visual arts. So this is the project in a nutshell. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing that we did, um, and we reported on the results last fall, was to conduct what we called scoping exercises to get a sense of what is happening in each of our areas or our, country, our countries, um, broadly speaking, when we think about the Nordic countries. Um, so what, was hap what is happening? What do we know about the non-religious? What don't we know? And what we can say across the board is that there's still limited survey and census data available. Um, very, you know, a, a little tick box on a survey, and on, on, especially on state statistics gathering that says non-religion doesn't really tell us that much about this very, very broad group. And so we're interested in developing measures that would um, dig a little bit deeper on this. But the scoping reports are actually available on our website if any of you are specifically interested in those. Each country had to prepare one to give a sense of what are some of the legal issues, for example, in each of these places. Um, what, are the, what are the data? What are the statistics showing us? Who is measuring? Who cares? Um, and then what are some of the issues around it? So for example, in Brazil, the contest is between Catholicism and Pentecostalism with a kind of laicite thrown in, but um, still when you saw the Brazil figure of 8.1% identifying as non-religious, we asked the question, is it possible structurally to identify as non-religious in given countries? And Brazil is an interesting case study in that. I'm also having that conversation with some colleagues in Turkey who may do a parallel study um, because um, Turkey has relatively 
um, narrow possibilities for people in terms of religious and non-religious identification. Very few people identify as non-religious, but that's because structurally it's quite difficult to do so. Okay, so beyond the scoping exercises, to the next slide, please. So our next task is research design, um, and this is where I welcome your, your thoughts as we move through each of these areas, and I've given you a fairly sketchy overview of this, but just to give you a sense of the scope of the project um, and what it is we're thinking about. So we're designing studies related to each of the focal areas, law, health, education, migration, and the environment, and I can tell you a little bit more about a few of those. We're in the process we were to have had a co-investigator face-to-face meeting in May, and of course that did not happen. So we're now retooling and trying, like, like we're doing today, to figure out how to do this co conversation um, not in person. It's particularly challenging for us because we do have this um, very broad um, geographic scope, which means that having a meeting with our, our, our Australian colleague and our Norwegian colleague at the same time means that one of them is getting up very, very early in the morning and the other is staying up very, very late. Um, and sometimes, as you can imagine, negotiating uh, project design is really something that can be a little bit tricky. It involves areas of expertise, maybe if I could go so far to say ego. So um, it's been a little bit challenging, but I have a good team and we're just moving through it a little bit more slowly than we otherwise would like. So. Research design, so I'll tell you a little tiny bit about a couple of the projects that we're working on. Next slide, please. So law, legal constructions of religion and non-religion. Um, and here, I've already mentioned a little bit about this, but we're looking, we're using the lens of the public controversy to enter into this, to see who's involved in these public controversies. Most of the controversies will have been at some level of court. Um, and these can include same-sex marriage, medically assisted dying, religious symbols in the public sphere. These are all things that come before the court. If we look at some of these, like, like same-sex marriage and medically assisted dying, if any of you look at any, any of the, um, the court decisions on these, and let's take Canada as an example, on same-sex marriage and medically assisted dying, the Carter decision um, and the reference through same-sex marriage, in both of those cases, Religion is very well represented in the interveners. And we might argue that maybe um, not as well represented by non, what we might describe as non-religious groups. So we're looking at patterns of conversation, um, language that's used. Uh, I'll pull out one example to, to just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. In the Carter decision, that's the, the um, assisted, uh, medically assisted dying case, what we, something that I think is very interesting that we saw in that case was a shift around the language um, of uh, sanctity of life. And so this is, the phrase sanctity of life is something that's traditionally been mostly used by relatively conservative religious groups to describe a particular position. What the Supreme Court did, and this is a, as a result of the um, submissions by some of the interveners and the parties, the court repossessed that, if you will, and now sanctity of life has come to mean something a little bit different within the Carter framework. And so those are the kinds of things that we're interested in. Sanctity of life has come to mean one's ability to control one's own life and one's death and, and to have a say in how one lives one's life, lives one's life and death. So that's just one quick example. The project asks who are the main actors and experts uh, in litigation processes, uh, parliamentary debates, what kinds of arguments are made, and again, we might look more closely at that, the use of that language sanctity of life um, and its repossession, if you will, um, and then what impact does the trans transnational arena have on these national controversies? And if I could go back to the example of Australia for just one moment. Um, this was something we talked about in the breakaway room for just a second. Uh, Australia right now has been in the midst of a somewhat heated conversation about freedom of religion legislation. That's primarily been uh, something that has been uh, lobbied for by religious groups, um, especially conservative religious groups. Uh, and so um, I'm, we're interested in 
what, is, what are the transnational or global flows around this? Uh, because there is a fairly organized freedom of religion lobby um, originating primarily in the United States. And so we'll look at some of the vectors. How, how does this become a global issue? And how is freedom of religion used in that context to imagine, for example, um, limiting the rights and freedoms of others? Um, and in, in Australia, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of conversation about the impact on LGBTQI communities. So that's just one example of a project. We're just, the phase we're at right now is um, choosing our controversies. And so each of us will have conversations within our own countries, within our own groups, in our own countries to talk about what are the controversies that are most salient for us. Um, we probably, we haven't chosen them in Canada yet. We're still looking at what we, what we want to um, dig deeper into. One of our goals will be to have at least one case study that will be common to all the countries. My guess is that that will be same-sex marriage, but I don't know for certain yet. It could end up being religious symbols in the public sphere, um, but um, we'll see. We'll see um, where that goes. But for now, that's where we're at. We're choosing those controversies. And again, I welcome your comments and thoughts about controversies that might be um, useful and interesting to go deeper into, to think about, okay, how, who are the parties in this? Who are the religious voices? Who are the non-religious voices? And what do those look like? What is the language that's used? Who has which language as whose territory, if you will? And again, going back to that sanctity of life um, example, we can see how this can shift. So it might be interesting to look at, look at how do these things shift. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, the environment, we're doing, we're in the process of developing a project on, we call it trekking toward awe, non-religion and hiking. Um, and really what we're interested in is this, as I mentioned, an, uh, an emerging worldview, a reimagining of nature. And some of you will know that that's a problematic term in uh, at least academic circles sometimes. Um, we're using it um, and uh, we're willing to, to engage in that conversation about why, it's, why we think it should be used. Um, but what are the sorts of experiences people have? And as you know, there's um, often conversations about awe and wonder. Um, and so we're interested in that. We're interested in how people are seeing the natural world around them, how they're engaging with it, uh, and then how they identify religiously or non-religiously and what that can tell us about emerging worldviews around um, our world and how we, our world around us and how we relate to it. Next slide, please. Migration, oops, uh, environment. Oh, no, back to, back. <laughs> the environment. Another one, um, uh, which, oh, I'm seeing a note here. I can't, I can't talk and look at the same time. I'll look at these afterwards. Um, and so community gardens, believe it or not, uh, is another space in which we see power negotiations. We see, we're able to see um, conversations around racial justice, uh, deeper systemic issues. Um, related to community gardens. And we think there's going to be something here around religion and non-religion and the imagination of who communi what community is, who belongs, who doesn't belong, and how that links to people's worldviews, uh, in particular around non-religion. That's a hunch. Um, we don't know, but we're interested in exploring this. Um, and so we're in the process of figuring out are there uh, sites? We know that there's a, a big community garden project in Melbourne. We know that there are, of course, many uh, in Canada. There's a, one that we're interested in, particularly in Parkdale in Toronto. Um, and we're, we're just simply exploring that at this moment. But this is, this is at the de design phase. Um, so that's the community, the community garden project. And it links really nicely with the trekking slash hiking project. And all of these will tell us something about the environment. Um, and I have to say that this is probably the, the area of the project that um, I'm intrigued by, even though I, I have training as a lawyer. Um, I'm really, I think this is where uh, worldviews will really start to shine through. Um, and I'm especially interested in, for example, um, perhaps a flattening of the hierarchical model, which has been largely, I would say, um, uh, promoted by the notion of stewardship, 
Um, although some people argue there's a distinction between stewardship and dominion, um, I'm not so sure. But I think that with a shift uh, out of majoritarian Christianity, although we're still in that, there might be the potential for a movement toward new language and new imaginings of the, of the world around us. Uh, next slide, please. Hmm. Migration. I've already touched on this. Um, and my colleagues, Peter Beyer and Inger Furseth, are leading this particular project. Um, how are public policies and debates framed in relation to migration? Um, how do, as I've already mentioned, non-religious migrants construct their non-religion? Um, is it possible uh, for, for non-religious migrants to be non-religious? Um, and what do the receiving structures we have set up look like? Uh, do they look uh, in a way such that it's very, very difficult for people to not have to identify, um, at least uh, nominally, as religious in order to access particular services and support. So these are the kinds of questions that we'll be, we'll be asking in the Migration Project. Um, next slide, please. Health. So um, right now, I've been focused on death and dying because I think this is an area that's um, of great interest in terms of thinking about practical application, particularly around palliative care, we started to do a little bit of research uh, on what is available to palliative caregivers that takes us outside of um, the framework uh, that's traditionally been used. And I, mean, I can just tell you from a personal standpoint, my interest in this was piqued when I was in the midst of a, a research meeting uh, that was looking at um, uh, hospitals and think, thinking about religious diversity in hospitals. And I was listening to um, Christian caregivers, and this is not intended to disparage Christian caregivers, but they were talking about palliative care uh, and, and talking about their approach. And arguing that it was non-Christian. And it was a little bit uh, intrigued by their arguments because it still looked to me or sounded to me like it was very much within that tradition. And so I wondered what does palliative care look like if we really do make the break uh, from that tradition, which has been the majoritarian religious tradition in Canada. And so starting to ask questions about what does chapl chaplaincy look like outside of that framework. Um, and some of you are very much involved in that, so I'm interested to hear um, what you might think about that. So palliative care, funeral rituals, uh, medically assisted dying, I've already mentioned that. Death cafes, we're looking at maybe doing a project on the death cafes where conversations are happening about deaths that are not intended to be religious conversations. And then things like memorials and the shape of memorials, so the, the ghost spike phenomenon. Um, and what does that, what if anything does that tell us about the shape of non-religion in contemporary society and where we might be uh, headed. So that's, that's one of the health areas. That's not all we'll do in health. Um, I'm also interested from a legal standpoint in the medical uh, exemption cases uh, and the impact on non-religious people, um, where the line is um, between you know, someone's religious freedom and then the right to, um, yes, faith-based pregnancy centers. Um, I'm just sort of keeping an eye on the chat as well. Um, and so we're, we're interested in other issues within the health uh, framework. This is, a, as I mentioned, a seven-year project. And so we're just at our beginning stages. Um, and so the death piece is where we started, but certainly we won't end there. And particularly my Argentinian colleague, Juan Marco Vagioni, uh, is an expert on um, reproductive care, reproductive access to reproductive technologies. Uh, and so he's, he's keen to um, develop projects along that line. Next slide, please. Education, um, my colleagues Salon Lefebvre um, and Linda Woodhead in the UK are developing this area. It's still in development, so I was a little bit reluctant to even put the slide up, but they've moved the project a little bit um, forward. And so uh, they and I are comfortable to saying we're looking at the religion science binary, um, what counts as knowledge. Um, and I think probably here is where, even though it doesn't strictly fit in education, 
think here's where it would be really interesting to look at the dis public discourse around COVID-19 and the pandemic um, and the language of science and evidence-based um, becoming fairly predominant, so doing a little bit of analysis around that and then looking at contests between science and religion in this context. Um, and I think we'll see this continue to emerge uh, in, when we get to the vaccine, um, which we hopefully do uh, around COVID and vaccine hesitancy. And that's where probably we'll see tensions rise again on this. So these are, I've read the slide, I assume that you can all look at it. Um, and it's just really boring when you do a PowerPoint and the person just reads the slide to you. Um, but I'm really interested, and so are my colleagues, in the science religion tension. Um, but not necessarily only putting non-religion on the science side of things, but trying to look at the blurry spots in that binary to see what's interesting there. So the next slide, please. What next? Um, we are um, continuing to work on project design, literature reviews. So there's tons of literature on pilgrimage, which actually fits in the trekking, hiking, walking. Um, we're not interested in pilgrimage, but that tends to be the literature that dominates. So we're interested in other literatures around that one, for example. Um, so these are just pulling on what the other academic pieces are. Um, there's a bunch of academic literature on awe and wonder, for example. Um, people who still want to push the non-religious into um, as soon as someone uses the word awe or wonder, they want to push it into the transcendent, um, which then leads to a place um, that we're not sure we want to go. So we're paying close attention to language in these discussions um, and, look again, looking at the academic literature, um, looking at what I've called in my own work the will to religion, um, the body count. So. Um, the academics who want to find everybody is really non-religious and the academics who want to measure everyone as religious if they mention the word awe. So there's a kind of tension there that interests me a great deal. Uh, we have ongoing events um, and collaborations. Um, we have a Meet the Authors series, which we're continuing to do online with people who are writing um, on this topic. And we, have, we invite them and then our team members, some of our team members come and some uh, people who are not team members. So if any of you are especially interested in that series, I'm happy to hear from you. Um, we will be hopefully holding our team meeting um, in person uh, in Ottawa next May, uh, no, pardon me, next June. Uh, and we'll co-host that with the SNRN um, conference, which is the um, Secularity Research Network. Um, and um, we also are doing partner consultations. So we have a number of partner groups. Um, some of them are formal partners, and some of them are, are informal partners. And for example, when I talked with Martin and Rick, I already asked them, said, would Humanist Canada, would you be interested in having conversations about the project, in vetting some of the proposals, in thinking about where we might head, what might be useful? Um, we're always looking, uh, I'm, uh, I should say, I'm always looking at public policy implications of research, not just to do um, research in a vacuum, but to make sure that it has some relevance to people's lives and what they're thinking about, what they're doing, their work lives, their home lives, um, their lives as publicly engaged citizens. So that's where we are with the project. It's a very quick overview. Um, and um, hopefully it gives you some sense of what we're up to so that you might feel um, inclined to be in touch, to uh, make suggestions, and certainly today to ask questions. Um, your ideas and your comments and questions are most welcome. Thank you so much. Lori, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just watching the chat go by and there's a lot of great ideas that your conversation has already uh, generated. So. Uh, we do appreciate that you participated today. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick question for me. If somebody does want to uh, contact you directly, what's the best way to do that? Email is lbeeman at uottawa.ca. Oh, okay. I'll make sure that everybody gets that. Um, and is I there also, a way I can, oh, sorry. Is there a way I can access the chat comments afterwards? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm copying them and I'll send you a copy. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
so it's L B E A M O N at uottawa.ca, correct? B E A M A N. M A N. So no wonder don't, my emails aren't getting through. <laughs> Uh, .ca. So I put it up on the chat line as well. Um, I'd also like to open up the, uh, uh, the forum for questions to Lori. So um, Anna, perhaps you can keep an eye on the hands that are going up. Uh, there's a question comment from Marty and I'm going to, yeah, there you go. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Lori. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. I know you have uh, lots uh, in the structure of this project. I mean, it's huge. It's going to go for seven years. So it, it's going to be a major commitment of your academic life. Uh, I, there's a couple of areas. I have my own uh, little kind of space that I was listening for to see if you've included it in your research. And, and that is because I'm a humanist chaplain. I believe that the plural, uh, pluralistic hubs like multi-phase centers in universities and hospitals and, and in prisons are going to be a really important part of uh, the integration and collaboration movement, which I've been involved with now for six years at a Western university. It is an area that the dialogue is very open and the churches are seeing a reduction in the actual congregation. So the churches are moving now into secular environments with their chaplains. And so the voice of secular chaplains are going to be extremely important. And I'm wondering whether you have any uh, of your seven or eight countries that are looking at the growth of these pluralistic hubs that are like multi faith centers, but they're also including secular worldview, okay? And this even includes the corporate world with the International Humanist Management Association. And we meet regularly and we're talking about how we can influence corporate behavior, particularly in terms of dealing with racism and in dealing with hiring practices, etc. These are secular voices now that are integrated into a predominantly religious world. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Marty. That's a really, um, I guess, question, suggestion. Um, in fact, one of the people that we consult with informally is a chaplain. Um, she's a religious chaplain in a hospital, um, and that is one of the reasons that I've consulted with her is to try to get a sense of what's happening in that area. Um, and I think you've named something that's very, very important. There is a bit of an academic literature on, the cha on chaplaincy, diversity in chaplaincy, um, secular chaplaincy already. And so what I need to do is sort out where our piece would be, where, what is it that we don't know? And I think maybe you flagged that for me. Maybe you flagged something that I, I uh, need to think about a little bit more. Um, of course, one of the things that I've paid a bit of attention to has been chaplaincy in prisons in Canada. And I mean, I'm sure you know at one point the idea that, oh, well, you know, the Christian chaplains could just, they can just take care of everybody. We don't need specific chaplains for, you know, other faiths or um, secular chaplains. So I think it raises a very interesting question about these multi-faith centers um, and who, who is included um, and how they're included. And I like your idea of maybe focusing on some of the multi-faith centers in universities. I think that's a really in intriguing idea. So I've made a note of that and I thank you for your question and comment. A uh, question from Michael. Hello, Lori, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, but I have a quick question. It, does course. your non-religion group, is that the same as the nuns? There's been yes. a lot of uh, literature written on the nuns and I just wanted to make sure that whether it's the same or what the differences are. Yeah, it's the same. Um, Michael, thank you. It, and thanks for clarifying that because people may be wondering. So yes, there is a literature on the N-O-N-E-S, not the, well, there's a literature on the N-U-N-S too, but um, the N-O-N-E-S. Um, Lois Lee is one of the, the, the founding leaders in this, although Colin Campbell was writing about it in the 70s. Um, and th so there's unbelief, non-belief, nuns, um, 
uh, I'm trying to think of some of the ir- the irreligious. Um, it, mm, I'm trying to think, but those are the ones that are coming to my head right away. So yes, this is the literature. The thing that's interesting about this, though, um, is that despite the fact that there's a, and it's a relatively recent literature, it sounds like you're a little bit familiar with it at least um, in terms of you know what that you're aware that it exists. I don't know how how familiar you are with it. Um, but it's still a relatively narrow, um, it's still a relatively narrow body of literature. And one of the things that's especially, there's a, especially interesting to me is that oftentimes non-religion defaults to atheists. And there are other forms of non-religion that are of interest to us as well. So agnostic, humanist, um, and, and I realize that these are often overlapping categories, but um, we're interested to as far as spiritual but not religious. What does that mean? And how do people mobilize one identity or another or both in particular circumstances? So non-religion, nuns, yes, that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, what does it mean when somebody says, I'm a nun? Um, there's a growing body, body of literature on the indifferent. People who say, I don't really want to talk about this. Like, I don't care. Um, just leave me alone. And there, there are quite a number of people within the, you know, 25 to 40, 50 percent, let's say, in Canada, who would say, eh, I don't, you know, I, I don't think about this stuff. I don't want to talk about it. So it, we're really interested in the broad spectrum. Did that answer your question, Michael? Yes, thank you very much. One of the things that's fascinating is there's a big subsection that's quite spiritual. Yes. Of the nuns. Yes. So the spiritual but not religious is also another group um, that interests us. Uh, and that's certainly on the, that's one of the reasons that we've tried really hard not to, people keep wanting to push us in terms of, oh, you have to define this. And one of the reasons we're reluctant to do this, we're talking about, you know, as we said, 25, 30, 40% of the population. Um, we're really interested in leaving this fluid for the moment because we want to leave it ourselves as much latitude as possible to really think about um, looking at pos- this is positive identity, the positive content of non-religion. What does this mean? What are people doing? What are they, you know, what are they thinking? What are they doing? Um, how are they engaging as citizens? Um, you know, religion occupied a lot of uh, baby boomer and particularly baby boomer women interest me a lot because. Um, you know, at, at another time, baby boomer women, uh, or women uh, who are now baby boomer women, women would have been spending a lot of their time in churches, supporting the church, church institutions. They're not any longer. So what does that mean? We have a group of women who went through uh, second wave feminism, highly skilled, and I realize we're talking about a very specific area of the world too, um, and so I don't want to pretend this applies to the whole world, but highly skilled second wave feminism, um, civil rights movement, et cetera, the, you know, the 60s. And now, what are they doing? What are they engaged in? Because many, many of them are not spending their time polishing brass in churches and supporting, you know, bake sales. What are they doing? I'm interested in that particularly, and that I imagine will end up being one of the projects within this larger project, but it, we just haven't designed that yet. But that's kind of off a little bit, but hopefully this gets at some of what you were thinking about when you asked your question. Uh, Lloyd, and can you please unmute your mic? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your presentation, Gloria. I, I agree with everybody else. It's a it's a it's a good presentation. Uh, I uh, am interested in particular in a comment you made about examining blurred boundaries between science and religion, and I'd like you to expand on that a bit more. In particular. Uh, I'm wondering if that includes the concept of other ways of knowing. Now, for background, for example, uh, this sounds quite postmodernist, but uh, an academic from the University of Calgary has written that science is a white male way of knowing. Uh, have you come across that? And, and, how, what's it, and, and can you expand on that, please? Mm, thank you very much, Lloyd. Um, so the blur, blur between science and religion. Um, I think the, the comment of science as a white male way of knowing, I think that obviously is part of what we should query. Um, 
But I'm also interested in the ways, for example, that particular groups of people are, are portrayed as being um, only, only situating themselves in scientific knowledge or only situating themselves in religious knowledge um, to the, each to the exclusion of the other. So looking at the entanglement between science and religion and non-religion is of interest to us. Um, I, don't know, I don't know where else to take this when I'm answering you, um, because this is a project that we're still, as I, as I said earlier, um, the COVID pandemic for me has really raised some of the issues that I think we ought to be exploring. So who is mobilizing science in what context, context? And then there's been a little bit of an attempt to portray religious people as, as not um, situating themselves within scientific discourse. And then we see some of what's happening around the COVID conversation as actually challenging that. Um, and so, so who identifies with which of these um, positions, if you will, um, and how is it being used? And I mean, for, for background, I don't know, because you've named some academic literature, uh, Bruno Latour has written about big science and small science and the mobilization of that and how people use scientific discourse in day-to-day -day life. So this interests me and our project as well. But we're still, again, this project is still being designed. So I'm sorry if this one sounds a little bit fudgy, um, it's just that we're still talking about where exactly we're going to head in this, and I'm certainly welcoming your suggestions and thoughts on this if you have some. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I notice it's, uh, it's after four. Laura, you have given us a tremendous amount to be uh, thinking about, inspired about, and uh, we look forward to some ongoing collaboration uh, with you in the years ahead. Thank you. I'm, I am hoping that there can be some ongoing collaboration because I think that it would be very useful for us to have continued conversation. Um, I'm delighted, as I said, to be here, wherever here is <laughs> today. Um, and I do hope that I have an opportunity to meet you in person. Um, in, in the years ahead. Uh, but thank you so much for your generosity today in allowing me to speak at your meeting. Um, and, you know, obviously Zoom is, is never the same as face-to-face, as -face, but um, hopefully uh, it's been a little bit useful for you to hear a tiny bit about the project and uh, invite you to email me, as I said, or go to our website and or go to our website and don't hesitate to send um, thoughts or suggestions that you might have. Absolutely. And I think you can rest assured that uh, many on today's call would be more than willing to do that. Um, so we're, we're just after the hour and, uh, uh, and I can certainly imagine that we can look ahead and have an opportunity to have you speak with us again uh, in person at a future conference, Lori. So thank you again. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining on today's um, annual general meeting and presentation by uh, Lori Beeman. Uh, so take good care of yourself. Um, if you have any questions, comments, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, we welcome all of those opportunities to uh, have you engaged as much as you'd like in uh, Humanist Canada. Just so you know, this, um, uh, this portion of the uh, AGM, the speaker portion, will be edited and will be available uh, on our website. So Laurie will let you know about that. And, uh, and as members, you'll get uh, a notice about that as well. And, uh, and indeed, we'll make the chat available to you all. So uh, with that in mind, um, this wraps up our time together today. Uh, be well, be safe, take care of one another, and we'll look forward to uh, our next annual general meeting a year from now. But in the meantime, uh, stay tuned for upcoming activities. Thank you all. <laughs>